as you can already tell from the title. Um, I will focus today on these very basic developmental biological questions, that is how cells differentiate, how cells specify in the nervous system of the fly. And as Fabian told me in the very beginning, um, you are not that familiar with fly embryogenesis and, and neurogenesis, so I will introduce that kind of briefly to you. Um, but starting with, I come from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, um, which um, is a, one of the largest universities in Germany, um, and it's one of the oldest and one of the most unknown universities in Germany. Nevertheless, um, its name comes from um, a Mainz citizen who uh, in the 15th century actually invented the book printing, the modern book printing with movable types and letters, which is Johannes Gutenberg. And uh, just to get you an idea of where we come from, so Mainz is located here, um, and this is Frankfurt, so it's very close to the airport. So it was kind of convenient to come here yesterday, even though it was so windy. Okay. Coming to science, the life cycle of Drosophila, I guess, is most known, uh, known to most of you. And um, so um, we have a life cycle of, of um, I mean, embryonic development, then larval stages, where basically the larva um, takes up food and grows and grows and grows and grows until it actually pupates. And then in the pupa, um, we have a complete um, remodeling of the organism. Um, and then from the pupa, from the pupal case, actually the, the adult flies hatch, and the cycle begins from the embryo again. And this is basically what we are looking at today: is embryonic development, and this is done in the fly within 22 hours. So it's a very short period in the life of the fly, and in 22 hours, actually everything is set up um, to build the first insta larva that is able to crawl, that is able to sense its surrounding, and so on and so forth. So neurogenesis actually is accomplished or um, completed within these 22 hours of embryonic development to give rise to a um, complete functional nervous system that allows the larva to crawl and um, to sense its surrounding, and so on. Um, and this is just a, a short movie to show you um, how embryogenesis within these 22 hours looks like. So we're looking at a lateral view of um, an early embryo. It's about to um, build its first row of cells here. Um, anterior to the left, dorsal to the top. And I'll start the movie, and what you will see is, so it's um, the first um, stages of embryogenesis. So we start at stage five now, which is the blastoderm cell formation. And uh, prior to that, um, in the embryo, we, uh, in the fly embryo, we usually have um, cell divisions, not complete, but just nuclear divisions. So the first 13 cycles of cell division are just nuclear divisions. And about stage five, we begin to cellularize the embryo. And I'll, I hope it'll work. I start the movie. It should work. It did work. Okay, it does work now. Okay. So now the cells form. Cellular, cellularization takes place, and then the, um, the germ band, the embryo basically elongates. So the egg is in principle too short for the entire embryo, so it has to elongate on the dorsal side. So this all is the embryo, and basically the ventral side of the embryo is located here, and this is the end of the germ band, and now it retracts again. And in these um, stages, neurogenesis takes place on the ventral side here, which you cannot really appreciate here. Nevertheless, we have a head involution, so um, structures are formed, the, the pharynx is formed, um, and then actually neurogenesis proceeds. The nerve cord, which is located here, the ventral nerve cord, and the brain hemispheres here condenses. And then, as you can see already in stage 17, which is end of embryogenesis, we have muscle contractions, so we have an, a functional nervous system with motor neurons innervating the muscles. They can contract. And then the last thing is that the, the trachea fill with air, and then the embryo hatches from its eggshell. And the first larva, first instar larval stage crawls around. So this is embryogenesis. Um, looking at the nervous system of the fly embryo, um, again, from the lateral side, a late embryo stained with a marker that labels the neural part structures. You can see the hemispheres from the side and the ventral nerve cord. And I will um, especially focus on the ventral nerve cord in my talk, which is um, arranged in this very typical insect type of, of um, rope ladder structure with um, commissures and connectives. 
And uh, when you label, in addition to the neural, uh, neuronal structures, which are shown here, also glial cells, which are in dark brown, you see that there's a very nice arrangement of both neurons and glia. And in contrast to our brain, that consists of about 90% glial cells and only 10% neurons. The fly nervous system has the opposite ratio, so we have about 90% neurons and just 10% of glial cells. Uh, the consequences behind that, uh, I won't go into details, but um, as you most probably know, um, glia also contribute to processes of synaptic plasticity and learning and um, that we have more glial cells in the, in the brain, in our brain actually, is reflected by the fact that we can, at least most of us, better learn than flies. I can't. Okay, looking at the fate map, again, a lateral view. We have um, already areas in the early embryo, so the um, pre-gastrular embryo, areas defined um, that will give rise to parts of the nervous system. And they're depicted here in colors. So in, in blue, in the anterior side, we have this procephalic neurogenic region. From this region, actually, cells will, progenitor cells will delaminate that give rise to the brain. And then we have in the, in the trunk, uh, thorax and abdominal parts where neuroblasts will delaminate that give rise to the ventral nerve cord. And um, what we know from previous work, basically done by in Gerd Technaus lab, is that in each of these abdominal segments, or trunk segments in the thorax as well as in the abdomen, um, these neuroblasts, these neural progenitor cells, which are called neuroblasts in the fly, delaminate from the ventral neurogenic region in a very stereotyped pattern. So in one, this is the ventral midline, in one hemi-segment, so the opposite is the same, um, 30 such neuroblasts delaminate at identified positions. So we can actually address these cells in rows and columns. They are numbered. And according to their position, each of these progenitor cells, each of these neural stem cells adopts a particular cell fate. And we can see that on the one hand um, by a combination of different marker genes that each of these neuroblasts expresses. So the position of these neuroblasts along the anterior-posterior axis of this segment as well as along the ventral dorsal axis specifies it, its cell fate. Also, the time point of delamination is important. And this results in this con um, specific set of marker genes that they express, and it also results in a specific cell clone that each of these neuroblasts will produce during neurogenesis. And I just depicted one example, which is neuroblast 2.5. It's an anterior, in the hemisegment, an anterior and very lateral neuroblast. And this neuroblast, as all the others, also divide in a stem cell-like mode, so it generates, it buds off a smaller ganglion mother cell, so-called, GMC, and is a self-renewing neuroblast, so it remains as a stem cell, at least for um, a couple of rounds of further divisions. And this ganglion mother cell typically then divides once more to give rise to two daughter cells, which may differentiate into neurons and or glial cells. So um, each individual cell clone, a neuroblast produces a stereotype cell clone of these neurons and or glial cells. And we have a clear view of or understanding of how these cell clones look like, basically done by a labeling technique which was invented in Gerd Technaus lab in the mid-90s which is so-called the di-eye labeling, and this is how such a cell clone then looks like. If you label one progenitor cell, in this case neuroblast 2.5, these are the progenitor cells of this stem cell. And the di-eye technique, just to briefly introduce that, is that you use a very thin, small capillary which is filled with this lipophilic dye, di-eye, and you place a droplet of di-eye in this early gastrular stage in the neural ectoderm, and this dye is then incorporated into the membrane of a neuroblast, at least if you're lucky. And then if this neuroblast keeps on dividing, um, the dye is inherited to its daughter cells, and you can label it, as you can see here. So we have a, and, and actually all these neuroblasts have been dye-eye labeled, and it was shown that each of these neuroblasts produces a stereotype cell clone. And when we look at the different clones that we have in the fly, we have mainly neuroblasts producing only neural cells, uh, neuronal cells. So these are neurons that all project contralaterally um, within the nerve cord. We have a, a few neuroglioblasts that produce both neurons and or glial cells. 
and we have only one true glioblast that only gives rise to a glial population, which is the, the glial precursor, the glioblast. And when we now look, and I'll focus on glial cell development, when we look at those progenitor cells that produce glia, you will see in blue, these are the ones, these are the guys that make glial cells in the, in the nerve cord. Um, um, and you can see most of them are located laterally within the hemi segment, um, some in the anterior region, some in the posterior region, um, but also NB11 and 22 are located quite medially. So the position of a progenitor, progenitor cell does not per se um, tells whether it produces glial cells or not. So there must be more behind um, to specify a neural glioblast than just its position within one hemi segment. And we know the cell lineages of all neuroblasts and shown are here cartoons for those that produce glial cells. So we know which glial cells originate from what progenitor cell. And this is quite clear and this is a fantastic situation to work with because um, the fly genetics allow us to, to manipulate and play around with cell specification processes. Um, and knowing which progenitor cell actually produces what kind of glia allows us to trace these cells even in a mutant background or in the background where we manipulated these cells. So it's a perfect tool actually to, to understand or to, to um, um, explore the, the, the molecular mechanisms behind cell differentiation and specification. And um, just for those who work with vertebrates, um, in fact the fly glia are by morphology nearly indistinguishable from vertebrate glia, um, except for one major, major difference, and that is the fly glia don't myelinate. So in our brain, glia cells myelinate axons, so we have a very, very tight layer of glial sheath around axons, which is called the myelin sheath, and in the fly nervous system, we don't have myelin. Still, the glia wrap around, at least some of the glia wrap around axons, so basically they fulfill the same function without producing myelin. And by morphology, they are hardly indistinguishable from vertebrate counterparts. Okay, when we look at an embryo, this is a whole mount embryo stained against a glial marker protein, which is called reverse polarity or repo, in green here, which labels the nuclei of all glial cells in the embryo, and stained against um, um, fasciclin 2, which is a neuronal adhesion molecule. Um, you can see that the cells nicely arrange um, in a stereotype pattern, both within the central nervous system as well as in the peripheral nervous system. Um, but we usually don't look just at whole mount preparations, but we flat prep the embryos. That is, we, we open up the dorsal side and prep the, um, or flatten the, the epidermis to the sides, remove the gut and everything that we're not interested in, and have a direct view onto the CNS. And this is how a flat preparation then looks like. And, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, Drosophila is already pretty small, and the Drosophila embryos are much smaller. Um, and flat prepping the embryos, I mean, the, the key to success is patience. Take your time and, and, and you know, practice. But it'll work. And, and finally, it'll look like this. Different colors, but the same staining. So now Repo is stained here in red, and Fast2 is in blue. And what you can hopefully appreciate is that, that uh, glial cells are arranged in a very stereotypic way um, in each segment. And this is another advantage of the fly. We're not just looking at one brain, but we're looking at repeated serial homologues, segments um, that can be um, um, analyzed in one embryo um, in parallel. So we do not have just one, one brain to look at, but we have different segments that we can address and analyze. Okay. Um, work that has also been done in the Technol lab in the mid-1990s uh, mid uh, was to classify glial cells according to their position and to their morphology. And this was basically done uh, by KE2 in the lab. And we um, distinguished between surface-associated glial cells that wrap around the entire nervous system, which is so-called the subperineural glia here, as well as the channel glia, which um, wrap around the dorsoventral channels, which are basically channels um, um, that run through the nervous system, so it's again surface. We have cells that are associated with the cortex, so with the neuronal cell bodies, um, which are the cortex glia or cell body glia, 
And we have glia cells that are associated with the neuropile, so with axonal structures of the nervous system. Um, and these are called the neuropile glia, which are longitudinal glia that lie on top of the dorsal, um, of the longitudinal connectives. And these are nerve-associated cells, such as the nerve root glia or peripheral glia that migrate into the periphery and wrap around peripheral axons. Okay. In the beginning, when I started my work um, in the Techna lab, what was known actually was that, um, and it is still believed, that the ground state of a developing cell in the nervous system is to become neuron. So neuronal genes are switched on in neuroblasts as well as in neuroglioblasts, and these will then give rise to neurons. Whereas for neuroglioblasts and for the glioblast itself, for the glial precursor, um, we have to change the ground state, we have to change the the default cell fate. And this is basically achieved by expressing a transcription factor called GCM, glial cells missing, which already tells you how the, the mutant phenotype looks like, because in the mutant glial cells are missing. Um, that's where the name comes from. It's the binary switch, the master regulatory gene for glial cell development. GCM as a transcription factor then switches on downstream target genes, and the best characterized one is <coughs> reverse polarity, which you've already seen. Repo, and this then will lead to further activation of glial genes and hence to become to the glial cell fate. And actually, this part, namely the, the onset of further dif differentiating gleans, genes, the glial genes, was my first aim when I started in the Techno Lab because actually the molecular program underlying glial cell differentiation was at that time completely unknown. So we started with a microarray screen aiming to identify further GCM downstream genes, which was done together with a PhD student in the, in the lab, Angela Becker. And we wanted to make use of the, at that time, novel technique of microarrays, um, comparing both the GCM gain and the GCM loss of function to wild type embryos. And just to just very briefly introduce the microarray procedure, so you usually compare two um, different situations, like the wild type and the mutant strain. You prep RNA from these. You reverse transcribe the RNA, um, thereby incorporating fluorescent dyes, either directly or indirectly, so like cyanin-3 and cyanin-5. So you have labeled cDNAs, and these are pooled and hybridized onto microarrays, onto gene chips, um, where actually, in our case, all the 22,000, roughly 22,000 predicted drosophila genes were spotted. And um, according to the hybridization then, um, you can actually tell whether a gene, whatever, was expressed in the wild type or in the mutant. And it's not just a an, an qualitative analysis telling you whether or not a gene was expressed, but you can even quantify the levels of expression. And this is what we did. And so we wanted to use uh, the GCM gain of function. So we tried to, or we wanted to ectopically express GCM in the nervous system. And as most of you might not know, how flies, or how we can actually do this in flies, it's the UAS GAL4 system that we use for that. And to very quickly introduce it, uh, you have a fly strain that expresses the GAL4, which is a yeast transcription factor. So it's not present in the fly, it's a transgene. It's a yeast transcription factor under control of a fly enhancer or whatever enhancer you would like, other than an endogenous enhancer. Um, and in this fly, so GAL4 is expressed under control of this enhancer in a cell and time-specific manner. But the fly actually doesn't care about it too much because GAL4 doesn't activate anything because it's a transcription factor from yeast. So you have a second fly strain that you then use, which is the so-called UIS strain. And UIS stands for upstream activating sequence. This is the sequence motif that is recognized by the GAL4 transcription factor. And you can clone your gene of interest, gene X in this case, under control of this UIS sequence and bring it into the fly. This fly doesn't care about it either because um, there is no GAL4 around, so nothing can activate gene X in this situation. Only when you cross these two flies and bring them both together, so we have the enhancer-driven GAL4 expression that now can bind to its specific UIS target site then you can activate gene X, in our case it was GCM. And it was, it was known that um, GCM, if early enough, expressed in presumptive neurons, that an ectopic, of G, ectopic expression of GCM in these neurons can transform them into glial cells. And this is shown here. 
So the GAL4 driver that we use is called MINDS 1060. And a MINDS 1060 driven um, expression, ectopic expression of GCM leads to a transformation about, of about 50% of all the neurons into glial cells. So many more repositive cells in, the, in this nervous system than compared to the wild type control. Assuming that in this situation, since we have more glial cells, we should have more GCM dependent glial genes being activated than wild type, and this should be present, or this should, should be something that we can see on the microarray. On the other hand, we wanted to compare the GCM loss of function to wild type. So basically a lack of glial genes <laughs> in comparison to wild type. And um, fly genetics allow us to um, actually um, balance homozygous lethal mutations such as the GCM mutation, which is homozygous lethal. And these balancer chromosomes are uh, easy tools or very nice tools because you can you know, tag these balancer chromosomes, for example, with the GFPs or green fluorescent protein. So within the fly, you can see the presence of these balancers by the green fluorescent protein, which is kind of easy. But we didn't want to analyze heterozygous flies, but we wanted to have homozygous mutant embryos compared to wild type. So we again had to cross these heterozygous parental generation in order to classical Mendelian genetics get 25% of homozygous GCM mutant flies. And these can be distinguished by the lack of GFP from the ones that we did not want. And this is actually how such a collection of embryos can look like. It's not exactly this, what I wanted to show, but, but it's, a, it's a nice representation. So you have embryos that express GFP, and you have others that do not. And in our situation, this would have been the homozygous mutant embryos. Right. So kind of easy, fly genetics. But for a microarray, and this was a huge problem for us at that time, um, we we need to prep RNA from just these population of homozygous mutant embryos, and you need thousands and thousands of embryos to get a single microgram of RNA that is needed for microarray analysis. And in this particular case, it would have been much easier to work with vertebrates, where you can have a single vertebrate mutant, and you can prep from one mutant thousands and thousands of microgram of RNA. And um, actually, this is one example of how vertebrate people do so, like you know, distinguishing genotypes, um, as we do in the fly using GFP, the vertebrate used the sheep sorter as one example. And I mean, this is representation of the sheep sorter. This is basically the sorting device. And what you see, again, Mendelian genetics, um, heterozygous cross. Oh, it didn't work. I'm sorry. Hopefully. Does it work? I hope so. Ah, here we go. So first, second, wild type, wild type. And that's the mutant sheep. <laughs> So the sheep sort is very, very easy as well. Uh, we made use of actually a fly sorting machine, uh, which is the same thing as a sheep sorter. Um, it's, it's a modified fax machine, so it's a fluorescent sorting where embryos actually pass a laser beam and whether or not they express GFP um, tells them whether they will be sorted in the sorted fraction or into the waste bucket. Um, so we were able to use such an embryo sorter to sort living embryos. And it was about a million embryos that we sorted of different stages. It was very, very nice. And actually, these were the stages that we examined on the micro area. And to cut a whole or a long story, and it was a really, really long story, uh, to cut it short, we actually found about nearly 3,000 differentially regulated genes in, in either experiments, so the gain or the loss of function compared to wild type, at different developmental stages. So in total, we, I think, hybridized something about 120 microarrays. To, for this entire analysis. Um, we, we then filtered in several rounds, um, getting better and better and better. And in the end, we came up with 70 novel genes that show a GCM-dependent GCM expression. And about 25 of these were exclusively expressed in glial cells. And we actually then classified and characterized the expression of these genes um, with respect to um, the glial expression and um, came up with um, you know, um, expression patterns that look like this in an in situ hybridization, and we drew cartoons with respect to the individual glial cells. And this is how it looks like. And I don't want to go into details of all these genes that we picked from the microarray, um, just to give you a few examples. And um, then actually end up with one example, a gene that we call Nazgul. And the Nazgul gene is um, 
um, or encodes an enzyme, a putative oxidoreductase of so far unknown function. We have no idea what this enzyme actually does, but due to its very nice expression pattern, we would love, we would love to know what Nazgul actually does in the glia. And this is how the expression in the embryo looks like, another flat preparation of a nervous system anterior to the left. And you see in this dorsal, ray, dorsal array of cells, these longitudinal glia, Nazgul is expressed, which is given here in white. And this is a higher magnification of this. It's a cytoplasmic protein, so we generated an antibody against the protein, which is the Nazgul antibody used here. And you can see in the Z section, it's the dorsal cells that lie on top of the neuropile that express Nazgul in a cytoplasmic way. And this is actually um, also true throughout larval stages. So this is the third instar larva. And in the brain, you have cells expressing Nazgul, which are also glia cells that um, sit on top of neuropile structures in the brain, as well as in the ventral nerve cord, as you can see here in the higher magnification. And um, you can nicely see that it's just particular cells that express Nazgul in its cytoplasm. Still, we have no idea what Nazgul does. So we generated Nazgul mutants. There were no available. Another actually advantage working with Drosophila is there are thousands and thousands of mutant strains available. Unfortunately, none for Nazgul. So we generated our Nazgul mutants ourselves, and we generated three different homozygous lethal lines, but they didn't show any phenotype with respect to glial cell differentiation or specification, neither in the embryo nor in the larva. But that was um, astonishing. Nazgul mutants, even though homozygous lethal, were viable at least until third instar. So we thought, if we don't see a phenotype, and this is, I mean, um, without a phenotype, it's really hard to address what does a protein do. In our case, we looked, uh, since we had L3, living L3 larvae, homozygous for Nazgul, we looked at the larval behavior and um, tried to find out whether they have a behavioral defect. And in fact, I mean, the, the setup, just, just briefly, um, we have an agar plate, um, so a petri dish filled with, with agar. We place the larva onto, on top of that, and there's a, a digital camera. Um, we used a digicam uh, in the first place, and now I have a better one with a better resolution, which is connected to a computer, and we can actually track the larva and how it crawls. And we now have a real setup, a box with uh, you know, constant temperature, light, humidity, and everything is set and defined. So we are getting better. And what we're doing is actually we track the larva. This is one larva and the starting point, and it crawls and crawls and crawls, and we can track this and um, actually extract then from these tracks and extract relevant data such as speed, the length of the path, the turning rates, how often does the larva turn, and so on and so forth. And we started, of course, with wild type, and then we um, have a kind of a statistical analysis of, of the putative phenotypes. So how does the larva behave in this setup? and in the end come up with the results, and I'll show you some, because we did actually find a phenotype in the Nazgul mutants. Um, so this is the wild type crawling behavior, and it's a very, very stereotypic um, exploration behavior of the larva, so it is placed onto the dish, and um, then it starts crawling, basically in a straight movement, it sometimes turns, and then times it looks around a little bit further and, turn, and turns again, and then has, again, phases of straight movement. And just a representation, again, of the same path here, and when you look at the points where the lava turns, you will see that this is actually, um, uh, you can represent this in this graphics here, the um, direction change, the degree of the angle of, by which the lava changes its direction. Okay. Um, and then the Nazgul mutants, and this is just a, um, it's a lousy video, but nevertheless, it's a video. And as you can see, this is the, a Nazgul mutant lava. And it has obviously a defect because it does not at all crawl straight on. It, it always turns, it seems to circle around itself. Okay, and this is how the track of this exactly the same lava looks like. So it keeps on turning, 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 turning. It doesn't move straight on. Um, and as you can see in comparison to wild type, um, it has a high degree of turning rates. And we have a second, so this is the, um, the Delta 136 mutant, which is the strongest allele that we have. Another mutant allele that we have seems to be a hypomorphic Delta 117. Um, compared to wild type, it also has an increase of, of you know, degrees or direction change rates. 
um, yet it's not as severe as um, the other allele. So in a statistical evaluation, this is how it looks in comparison to wild type. It's highly significant in um, both 136 and 117. The differences are there. So what do we learn from that? Nazgul is expressed in longitudinal glia, which are glia that lie on top of the neural pile. They don't have, at least not as we can tell by now, don't have direct contact to motor neurons. So how can Nazgul positive cells, these longitudinal glia, how can they change motor neuronal behavior? Because this is what we see. I mean, we see motor neurons when the lava crawls. Um, so we, so we asked, actually, how can Nazgul control motor neuronal behavior? But maybe it's not the motor neuronal behavior that we're looking at, but we're looking at an integration of input information. So we're looking at, uh, actually, um, alteration of neuronal integration here. Because Nazgul positive cells wrap around interneurons, which connect the brain to the output center, which is motor neurons in this case. So we were asking what kind of input is needed, uh, what kind of integration takes place and is altered in these Nazgul mutants. And um, that was actually an astonishing finding was when we, when we place, and this is what we initially did, we placed the lava on these agar dishes and the agar was poured with water. And this is how the, the path looked like. And when we now poured the, uh, the, this, these agar plates with apple juice instead of water, so kind of represent a nutritive, uh, nutrition or uh, nutritive environment, um, the phenotype is reduced. It's still there. It's still significantly different to wild type, but it is highly reduced. As you can see here, so it's hard to read. I'm sorry for that. So this was um, the first um, evaluation on water agar, highly significant compared to wild type, but now placed on apple juice. The phenotype is strongly reduced, close to wild type in the 117 mutant, and still not wild type in the 136, so in the, the stronger allele, still present, but again, significantly reduced compared to water agar. We have no idea what actually is the sensory input that the lava receives here that changes this phenotype. And we're trying to figure this out with respect to, does, is it, for example, the sugar, is it the apple juice, so the, Good question. There's no difference between wild type placed there. So this is the wild type, and it doesn't change its behavior on either water or apple juice. And we did water, apple juice, apple juice, water, uh, back and forth and back and forth again. And it, I mean, the changes in the mutants are there, and the, there's no change in wild type. Did you check the pH of the apple juice? Not yet. But this is something we're going to do. Just change, taking water again and adjusting the pH according to the apple juice plate. Exactly. Good, good point. We're doing that. So uh, these are, I mean, these are very preliminary data, which um, just indicate we have a sensory input integration, which is altered in these Nazgul mutants. So just a quick summary: Nazgul is expressed in these glial cells that wrap around CNS axons, these interneurons. Um, the cytoplasmic en enzyme has a homology to retinol dehydrogenases. Um, so basically, especially to uh, uh, number 13 of the human retinol dehydrogenases. Um, they have these behavioral defects, and obviously it's kind of an integration defect of, of sensory input information. We'll continue to work on that. Okay, coming back to the micro origins, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, um, I won't go into details of all these genes, but these are, this is a list of the candidate genes that we're currently working on. Um, and to our surprise, actually, at the, um, the outcome of the microarray screen was that none of the genes that we picked as GCM target genes is expressed in all glial cells. Even though GCM is expressed <coughs> and required for the development of all glial cells, none of the target genes that we picked is expressed in all. Which actually told us that glial cells are different. And it's not just the population of cells, are homogeneous, but cells have different cell fates and coming from a very <coughs> developmental, biologically oriented lab, we asked how do these cells adopt their particular fate. So are glia, are glia cells genetically specified? This is what we assumed. Um, if so, what's the molecular program that underlies glial cell specification? And I will very, very briefly just touch this question. Um, 
So um, actually another PhD student in the lab, Root, analyzed a huge array of, of different marker genes um, with respect to their expression in glial cells and trying to address the question whether glial cells can be identified according to a molecular according to molecular differences. And in the, just as a representation, um, another cartoon of, of uh, different markers that are expressed in glial cells, not only in glia, as you can see here, for in grail, like C is also expressed in neurons, but just in a very few restricted set of cells. So Ruth analyzed all these different markers and came up with a, with a um, cartoon, with a sketch, showing that all the different glial cells can indeed be identified according to their combinatorial code of marker gene expression, which is, again, a fantastic situation to address um, the question, how do these cells specify? Because we can follow individual glial cells even in a mutant background where the position might not be like wild type because they keep expressing these respective markers and we can address these markers and tell where are these glial cells then located, how do they behave, what do they become. become. And actually as a, as a tool, and I would like to show this, I'm just leaving this here, this is an interactive map of all the glial cells. It's basically the same cartoon that you've seen before. And when I just move with the cursor over these cells, you can, you can, which is really a nice tool for us to, um, to play around with, I can look at individual glial cells and just get an idea of which markers do they express, which marker can I use to, to address a particular glial cell in a respective mutant background. Or vice versa, I can look at these markers and see, okay, how are these expressed in which glial cells? And as you can see, this is a, a set of marker genes that we picked from the microarray, which are not yet characterized. And you see that these are nicely expressed only in subsets of glial cells. And it's a very nice tool to address exactly this, this question of which cells express what marker and vice versa. Really very nice tool. OK, coming back to the, to the question. Um, what Ruth also did, not just characterizing all these markers, but what we then um, came up with, um, she um, clustered the glial cells, all these individual glial cells that we see in one segment of the, of the nerve cord, she clustered these cells um, according to their marker gene expression. So cells that have a similar um, set of marker genes expressed are grouped together in this branch. And what um, Ruth came up with here was a very nice finding, and that is the cells that were, according to their position and morphology, already characterized or grouped together by this work done by Kei Ito in the 1995. Um, actually, this uh, is the same um, um, classification that we see when we look at the molecular markers. So the, the, basically, the molecular um, and the morphological classifications are in line with one another, telling us that, yes, there is a molecular program underlying glial cell specification, and this molecular program tells individual glial cells what to become and where to locate. But the question still is there, how do these cells differentiate, either as subgroups of cells or as individuals? And um, I mean, they could be by lineage, by position, along the AP or the dorsal ventral axis, by time, by cell-cell interactions. This we can exclude by now, more or less, or by factors we have no idea of. And we're still working with that. and just want to, again, briefly touch what we're doing here is, and when you look again at the sketch of, of uh, where are the progenitor cells located in one segment that produce glial cells, and when, you, when I draw your attention to these two guys, basically, the NB13 and 25, and the third one, which is the glia precursor, these two precursor cells give rise to glial cells that are highly motile and migrate over long distances. The glia precursor is located on the very lateral edge, and these cells migrate towards the midline in order to then line up along these dorsal, do, dorsal uh, connectives and form the longitudinal glia, whereas NB13 and 25 produce glia cells that are born in the CNS and migrate along motor neurons into the periphery over really long distances. So especially these two, if you look at these two neuroblasts, they are located anterior in the segment and very lateral. Does that tell these neuroblasts to produce, if they, if they produce glia, to produce peripheral glia? Is this position information important for peripheral glia? So asking, what happened if we used NB24 as a model? This neuroblast only produces neurons. What would happen if we transformed these neurons into glia? Would they become peripheral glia? 
And we did so, and one of the GAL4 strains that we can use for this experiment is the Eagle GAL4 driver. It's restricted in its expression to only four neuroblasts, among which is this NB24. So we did so. This is the, NAS, uh, the Eagle GAL4 UAS GFP expression in wild type, in an otherwise wild type background, so we don't change any cell fates or so. Just to give you an idea of how it is expressed, you can actually address these individual cells. And when you go through the set stacks, you can see which cells belong to what cell clone of neuroblast. At least some in our lab can. So I did the same experiment, transforming neurons into glia, ectopically expressing GCM. The same experiment as we did for the microarray. In this case, we're using Eagle GAL4. And as you can already see here, there are cells which are ectopic glia cells. They should have become neuron, but now become glia, and they migrate into the periphery. So yes, indeed, we can transform glia into uh, transform neurons into peripheral glia that migrate as if they were endogenous peripheral glia. And in more detail, you can see this here. This is just one focal plane, and in the um, you know in the Z section, you can see that they nicely align with the peripheral nerves here. Um, and they actually intermingle with the endogenous peripheral glia. So the, the endogenous number is present, and they, these ectopic glia cells intermingle with the other ones. So they behave as peripheral glia. And um, so we actually saw that, yes, uh, neurons derived from NB24, if transformed into glia, behave like peripheral glia, telling us, okay, at least the peripheral glia cell fate, to, one, uh, to some extent, um, may... Um, rely on the position of the progenitor cell being anterior and lateral. And we're currently addressing which genes are expressed in this set of neuroblasts and which could you know, be responsible, which genes could be responsible for the peripheral glia cell fate. OK. OK, this is back. So coming back as, as kind of summary, um, um, and we can very quickly go through this. So the position of the neuroblast may, may contribute to this, uh, to the question of how cells specify along the anterior posterior as well as the ventral dorsal axis. And within one neuroblast lineage, not all daughter cells are the same. So actually the neuroblast lineage um, is specified by a so-called temporal specification. So genes, transcription factors that, that are expressed one after the other in a kind of cascade, um, division after division, at least in the ideal situation. So after the first division, the, this transcription factor hunchback is inherited to the ganglion mother cell and gives its early identity, whereas the last division produces a ganglion mother cell that inherits like PDM as a transcription factor and tells this ganglion mother cell, I'm the late one in the lineage. And then as a third kind of uh, level of cell specification, of course, ganglion mother cells don't produce identical sibling cells, but even the two cells that, that are produced by a ganglion mother cell are different from one another. They can be as different as neuron and glia sibling pairs. That does exist in the fly. And this is, of course, um, achieved by asymmetric distribution of, of factors which are present in the ganglion mother cell, so that one cell A inherits one set of, of genes, whereas the other cell B inherits a different set. So, um, and the current hypothesis that we have is actually that cell specification with respect to glial cells is a mix of all these levels. So the position of the neuroblast might, might tell something, but not all. Maybe the temporal specification is involved here as well as sibling cell fate differences. OK. Coming to the last part that I would like to, to touch today is migration of glial cells. We have, we've seen that cells migrate already with the peripheral glia. Um, and the question was, why do some glial cells migrate over long distances, whereas others don't, do not? Why do they migrate in opposing directions, in literally any direction in the nerve cord? Um, how do they navigate? How do they know where to go? Um, which guidance molecules are involved herein? And um, so we looked at the pattern of peripheral glia as the model to, to investigate this. And you can see that it's actually in each abdominal hemisegment, we have 12 peripheral glia cells that align along these peripheral nerves, either motor neurons or sensory neurons. So motor neurons are labeled with FAS2, sensory neurons with FUG, 22C10. Um, and the glia cells align. So we, we, again, analyzed markers, and I skipped this. We know individual glia cells are, are there, and we actually found that the position of each individual cell is more or less fixed. So there's hardly any variation in where the cells align along these peripheral nerves. 
So we can actually number them from, from proximal to distal, one to 12, it's 12 peripheral glia. Um, and we monitored these cells in vivo by um, a setup 4D recording, which was established in our lab. And this is just a preparation of that, but I can show you a movie. Um, so the, the embryos are glued to a cover slip, and this is actually the, the, the side where the embryo is glued to it. Um, the CNS is around here, so the ventral midline is somewhere here, and the exit area where the cells leave the CNS, what you will see here, anterior to the top. And I will start the movie, and you will see, I mean, the embryo moves in its eggshell, so there's some gross movement per se, but you will see that there are individual cells that leave the CNS and migrate into the periphery. And we monitored not just one, many, many, many embryos to actually find that, yes, it's a stereotypic pattern of migration. It's always the same cell that leaves the CNS first. It's always the same cell that follows. And there's hardly, I mean, there's little, but really not, not worth mentioning um, variation in the, the pattern of migration. Can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Do you see these glia divide me while they are migrating? Or they no. Divide only the... no. So um, the cells that you have seen here don't migrate, uh, don't divide. There are glia that divide <coughs> during migration, such as the longitudinal glia. Right, the no longitudinal glioblast, which is located very lateral um, at the border of the ventral neural ectoderm, actually, uh, migrates towards the midline, and during migration it divides. But then the glia can divide wherever in the brain, not only in certain places. I, mean, the I guess so, yeah. <coughs> can divide in the periphery. They, they can, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, there's ongoing work. There's one, um, one cell lying here in the exit area, which is actually, actually this guy, EPG2. And this guy um, divides uh, in the larval stages to, to actually produce more and more peripheral glia during larval development. Okay, another very short movie, just one hemi segment, and I want to um, actually draw your attention to these two guys here. As you, did you see that? They, they can change, they can overtake one another. And they can actually even overtake other glia cells. These were the only two guys that, that show this behavior being able to overtake other cells and themselves sometimes. And these two guys actually um, are the reason why we do see slight variations in the migration procedure because they sometimes overtake um, one another or other cells. Whereas the rest of the cells migrate in a chain-like fashion in a very a fixed order. A couple of hours. So we asked which molecules are involved. Very shortly, we looked at natrons, so uh, guidance molecules, secreted ligands that are known to uh, be uh, responsible for, uh, for axon guidance. And um, their receptors are um, UNC5, uncoordinated 5, and DCC, frazzled in, in the fly it is called. And to, again, to cut a long story short, we did find mutants or uh, phenotypes in natron mutants. Um, with respect to the migration of peripheral glia, so this is a wild-type um, hemi-segment again, and in this particular area, you should find these six glia cells, and in natural mutants, we only found four. And maybe this as a kind of an, not advice, but just a comment to all the young researchers of you uh, who get kind of frustrated because your PIs tell you to look at wild type and, and closely investigate the wild type at first. If we hadn't done that, if we hadn't investigated the wild type, the wild type with such a detail, we wouldn't have seen that phenotype because there are cells in the periphery, so that it's not a block of migration per se. It's just two cells that don't migrate. And it has been overlooked by others because other, other labs looked on glia migration in natural mutants in the periphery and didn't find a phenotype. They didn't know that it was exactly 12 cells and they couldn't address the identity of these. We could because we invested the time to really closely look at the wild type situation. So do so. If your boss says, do it. So there's a second kind of phenotype, um, which is a cluster of cells, which is again uh, not present in wild type, but in the net AB mutants. And we found that on the one hand, these clusters of cells represent longitudinal glia, which are ectopically positioned. 
And this is a failure of the longitudinal glioblast to migrate towards the midline. And if, if it does not, the cells stick to the place where they were born and um, then are located as clusters in the periphery, leaving gaps in the CNS, obviously. And we also um, looked at which cells don't migrate into the periphery in the NetAB mutants, and we found that, that, that is actually these two guys that I showed you in the one slide, in the one movie that overtake one another, these two guys fail to migrate into the periphery in NetAB mutants as well as in UNC5 mutants. So we could show that um, the migration of these two cells is dependent on the ligand natrin and the receptor UNC5. And we could rescue the phenotype, of course, um, of these peripheral glia, bringing back UNC5 in an UNC5 mutant in a glial specific way, um, rescuing uh, to wild type completely, um, whereas this um, ectopic cluster of longitudinal glia cells could not be rescued with UNC5 because this is frazzled dependent, so it depends on the other receptor. Okay. We did statistics for that, and due to the time, I will skip this. And actually, the model is that early in development, the longitudinal glioblast is attracted via frazzled towards the midline because there are neuroblasts um, in the ventral neurogenic region that express netrins. They attract the neuroblast, the longitudinal neuroblast, so that the longitudinal glial cells actually align close to the midline. Whereas at mid stage 14 round, um, the peripheral glia, namely EPG6 and 10, these two guys that, that migrate on top of the other glia cells, they express UNC5. And at that stage, the midline glia cells um, secrete natrin again and repel these two guys so that they actually align into or migrate into the periphery as a repulsive readout of natrin signaling. Okay. We found some more striking uh, phenotypes in the natrin mutants, that is, axonal phenotypes which um, are not due to a lack of natrin signaling in axons, but due to the fact that there are glia mispositioned in these segments. But I won't go into the details, and there are a couple of open questions which I won't, won't address here today. But we are continuously working on that. And something that, that I would like to mention is that um, we actually looked, or, and we are now have a PhD student um, working on that. We are looking at the intracellular uh, signal transduction cascade that um, allows the glia to read natrin signaling and to respond to natrins and either be attracted or repelled by natrins. And we're working on this. An interesting feature that there are molecules among them where vertebrate homologs are known, like DOC 180. <coughs> the fly homolog is myoblast city. And the myoblast city has a very pronounced migration defect in glial cells. And DOC 180. Um, at least there are some data um, showing that uh, DOC 180 is um, responsible for the invasiveness of, invasiveness of glioma cells in vertebrates. So there's the, it might be a very nice model to look at um, the intracellular signaling cascade in flies in order to understand even human pathologies like gliomas and stuff like that. Okay. What we also address, and this is quite, um, quite unique to our lab, because we're, well, we're doing this in collaboration with the lab of Angela Jangrande in Strasbourg, is um, we like to, to understand the role of individual glial cells during migration. So what we found and what I showed you was that this, the migration is very stereotyped. It's always the same cell that leaves the, the CNS at first, which is basically here, EPG9. This is the first cell that actually arises here and migrates into the periphery with EPG7 being the one that always follows a second. And then EPG6 and 8, you know, migrate on top of the glial chain later. And so we asked, what would happen if we killed EPG9 in the course of migration? So does EPG9 really represent a pioneer cell? Does it lead the track and all the others simply follow? What, what happens if we just kill it? And we do so. Um, by laser ablation, and this is basically the setup, so we express a GFP in the embryo in glial cells so that we can address individual cells in the living embryo, place these embryos in a way that we can uh, use a UV laser to kill cells, and then follow migration over time. And this is how it is done. So this is, again, such a glued embryo. And in this uh, one embryo, we targeted EPG9, so the first, the, the, the putative pioneer glial cell, in this hemisegment, and we targeted EPG7, so the follower cell in the upper segment here. 
And after laser irradiation, at least at first the GFP is gone and it doesn't recover, so the cells are really gone and we see that later, that indeed the cells are completely gone, they're dead. And when you then follow the migration, you will see that actually here in this case where we ablated EPG7, EPG9 is already present in the, in the periphery. Whereas here where we ablated EPG9, the cells stick in the, uh, are, are trapped in the exit area and don't migrate into the periphery. So indeed what we found, and we did, um, we did so with, um, you know, in repeat experiments, and we then flat prepped this embryo and stained it, and we can here really show that the cells are not there. They don't just switch on GFP again, they're, but they're really dead, they're gone. And we see that in this case, um, the cells remaining in the CNS are, um, um, are clustered here together. So there's, there's a stalling phenotype. No, sorry, here, here we go. There's a stalling phenotype, and the same happens in the, the other segment. So what we found as a conclusion here is, and this is another example where we ablated EPG9, the cells remain in the CNS, so it's a stalling phenotype. So what we found is that yes, indeed, EPG9 represents a pioneer glia that's, that leads the track. And without EPG9, the cells are stuck in the exit and don't migrate. Uh, we see that EPG7, the second cell leaving the CNS, is a follower that has permanent contact to EPG9. And if this contact is disrupted because we kill EPG7, if the chain is disrupted, the remaining cells also don't migrate. So we need a continuous chain where the cells actually have contact to each other in order to properly migrate into the periphery. So, and this tells us if we look for signaling molecules that are responsible for guiding glial cells, we don't necessarily have to look at all glial cells. We have to target EPG9 in order to understand how these cells find their way. Right. And what we also saw, and we also saw um, in the natural mutants as well, is EPG6 and 8 kind of migrate independently of this glial chain because they can migrate on top of the others and, and overtake one another. Okay. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the people that actually did the work. I'm just summarizing that. Um, so basically, things that are done in the Geotechno lab, Angela Becker uh, was involved in the uh, in the microarray screen, Ruth Becker for the Zandvoort, as a PhD student, investigated all these different marker genes and, and found that glial cells in the CNS are individuals. We are all individuals and the glia as well. Um, Christian von Hilchen um, um, was involved in the migration story as well as in the ablation story. Andres de Fisser is doing this larval behavioral crawling assays for Nazgul mutants. Tina is also involved in the ablation story um, and does other things which I did not touch here today. Um, Jan is investigating the downstream signaling components that are um, actually responsible for natural or migration signals. And um, Alvaro is a PhD student who's working on um, actually a vertebrate homolog in the fly, uh, NG2 in a fly called Contiki, in a different topic which I also didn't, didn't talk about today. Um, done, uh, work was done in collaboration. Jörg Wu has uh, contributed to the microarray screen. Angela, Jan Grande, um, we're collaborating with um, at present um, for the uh, migration and uh, ablation story. And Christian Clement, um, we're working with, with different candidate genes that we've worked together. And the whole thing was funded by different funding bodies, primarily the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And just to know you how these guys look, these are the ones, that, this is actually my current uh, lab crew. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.